That is right. So thanks so much. Thanks for the kind inv invitation. And um, yeah, thanks for setting up this, uh, I think, first wonderful workshop on the topic that's quite close to my um, heart. It's great to be here and to literally see you as a 3D sensation. I've become too much used to the idea that the world was two-dimensional. So in this talk, I will be trying to be rather faithful to the theme of the workshop when we have a look at random tensor networks in three ramifications when we meander through the theme on statistical mechanics over complexity to um, holography. And there's a couple of entry points that make sense here that also resonate well with a couple of things that we have heard today over the day and also will hear more later um, this uh, week. So this is kind of, there's a kind of, this is my manifesto of the talk if you want which is basically the insight that we as uh, scientists would like to, from a mathematical or physics perspective, understand complex statics or dynamics of quantum many-body systems, but that's commonly intractable and it's very hard to come up with rigorous statements of a sort on such complex um, many-body systems. So the idea is to think of random objects of random tensor networks as proxies for the real thing for complex statics and dynamics, but in a way that is amenable to a rigorous study in, in, in a way. Say for random circuits that can be seen as instances of random tensor networks, one knows that they share features of what could be called quantum chaotic dynamics in the sense that share features of out of time ordered correlation functions. One can think of notions of many-body localization where interaction and disorder comes together for random circuits in a similar way as for quantum many-body systems. And I actually thought that Norbert would speak precisely about that in his talk, which I think he had announced, but he switched topic, but, 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 but never mind. So that's, these are like proxies for the real thing, but they are much easier to address from the perspective of rigorous study. And one can say a lot more about these things and then for the, the actual system at, at hand. Or um, typical, typicality comes in. So ideas that something is typical for something as it's commonly um, used in quantum statistical uh, mechanics. Say random tensor networks can be seen as typical states in quantum phases of matter in basically this sense here. One can think of holographic prescriptions and so on. And we will also have a look at that um, later in the talk. And also the idea of random tensor networks is not completely dissimilar from the mindset of random coding information theory, where we know that random codes are very powerful and need techniques to see like how bounds in capacities are actually um, can be tied in a way that's really hard to come by with like deterministic um, encodings. So to cut a long story short, the upshot of all this is that um, randomness is a powerful tool, as a powerful proof tool, and that one can really prove statements that are really fully, completely out of reach. Otherwise, it's not quite the real thing, but for what they say, one can really say quite powerful and, and, and strong things. And this is the, the one point I'm trying to get across in this talk in three different, three, or two and a half, the latter bit will be um, somewhat uh, shorter, depending on how it goes with time. But I realize that I'm between you and dinner, so I will not over, um, go over time. Good, so the first reading is related to random tensor networks being some sort of instances of typical representatives of quantum phases of matter. And this question we will abstractly ask, but also how features of quantum statistical mechanics can be proven using random tensor networks as, as tools where one can say something about a, a, a meaningful statistical mechanics question in a way that's really hard to come by Otherwise, as a, again, as a proxy for the real thing, but where one can sit down and, and, and prove it. In the second reading, we will go to the now somewhat famous brown suskin conjecture on a notion what is called complexity on the linear complexity growth of random quantum circuits in the depth of the circuit, where we will ask, yes, the complexity, as we will precisely define, is computationally hard to compute, so how can this notorious conjecture be proven after all? Spoiler, we will do this and 
have a hint at the proof, depending on how it goes with time, I will say a bit more about this, whether this conjecture is really true or not on random circuits. As a bonus track, if I may, I will say something about what we somewhat jokingly called quantum homeopathy on random quantum circuits, but there's a, a, a serious theorem behind this that I might want to share. And it's also a bit of a um, representation theory um, result. And the final point is that, well, I might have time to go into or not so much, is to use tensor networks as toy models for holography. Um, also the ads CFT correspondence. That's a topic that Michael Walter will elaborate on a lot in his tutorials later this week. That's a, a great place to be in for random tensor networks and to, to make statements in settings that are very hard to come by. And maybe ask the question, in what way randomness does help to formulate like smooth critical conformal P theories? At least I get a, give a bit of a hint on how this can possibly work. So that's our agenda for the time between us and dinner later. Good. Okay, statistical mechanics of random matrix product state. This is not a new question that we start from. In fact, it's one of the oldest questions that has been, have been posed in the history of quantum physics. So that this gentleman here was already in 1929 complaining um, about the observation that statistical physics and quantum dynamics don't seem together so well. I mean, statistical physics talks about ensembles or equilibrium states in maximum entropy states of a sort, whereas quantum dynamics speaks of the pure states that are evolving in time generated by some local Hamiltonian of a sort. That doesn't really seem together uh, um, so, so, so well. But well, he was a very um, um, a smart man. And even at that time, he kind of understood how this is going, how it can be that there are seemingly um, equilibrated properties in, 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 in physics, in that surely if you have a many body system evolving in time under some local Hamiltonian, one cannot expect the entire system to equilibrate after all. But what can be true, and that's generically the case, so one expects is that if one has an evolving state in time, if one goes into the lab and performs a local measurement of a local observable, this will for most of the times look perfectly equilibrated and will take a, a, a fixed value, the value of the time average, and it will fluctuate. The second moments around this will be very small, so it will fluctuate very little around these moments so that if you go into the lab and measure, you will basically always get the same um, value over and over again. So this is the common expectation, and that was actually in its setting already um, formulated by von Neumann in, 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 in 29. In the meantime, the, the setting has been quite nicely understood and established that this is what one expects to be true. Expect that there's very few settings where one can prove that, that such an effect is really happening and one does not wave hands to say that this is kind of the generic expectation, but it's not so easy to see that this would actually be happening. So how can one judge? And um, trying to be faithful to the theme of the, the workshop, a good class of initial states to be picked is the one of random matrix product states, random tensor network states or random tensor trains if you want as initial states. So these are the, um, the matrix product states that we have seen many, many times over the day, also in Joseph's and Marikam's tutorials, in, in, and also just a, a second ago as a linear, tensor train with a physical dimension small d going down and a big um, capital D bond dimension going to the neighbors. And that's a meaningful set of states that we love and cherish. These are the MPS, the many paper states. And, um, and of course, it makes a lot of sense to think of random ramifications thereof. Yeah, there's many ways we can think of a meaningful probability measure of that in, 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 in that sense. One way of thinking about this, and there's also beautiful work by um, Cecilia on, on this topic, and together with Mary Bacon, uh, with um, W. Pierre Garcia, of just taking a dummy index, seeing this as an isometry, and then picking high random unitaries and place like IRD high random unitaries or the, from the unitarily invariant measure on the tensors and see this as your family of state. If you want, so this can be seen as a 
generic representation of a phase of matter. So to come back to Noah's question, like almost all states are also injective. So you can also think of a, in, at least in one dimension of a unique parent of a parent Hamiltonian of which this is the unique ground state. So instead of seeing this as a family of states, you can also see this as a family of ground states of a family of disordered many body local Hamiltonians. So this is just a, a kind of disordered many body Hamiltonian that you can think of in a in the trivial phase of matter in in in, in this and in, the, in yeah in the two core cycle sets as, as Norbert has explained. And on this, a number of interesting properties can be shown, but I will only talk about one of them to keep it. I, I'd rather keep it short than, than run over time. I think you will. Yeah. No, no, not in the representation. No, 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 no. It's just no, it's, it's dudes from a phase of matter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, we have some representation data, but it's not meant in the sense of the representation. Good. So um, there's one thing that I will look at or will highlight, which is if you take such states and look at the evolution under a generic state, meaning that all gaps are non degenerate and the, and the differences of gaps are non degenerate, then these guys will actually nicely um, equilibrate and they will do so exponentially well, which means that the probability of the um, expectation value, if you go into the lab of exponentially deviating from the mean, it's exponentially suppressed in the system size in N, which is a very strong statement. So there's teeny weeny uh, uh, fluctuations around the setting. Yes, please. Uh, I, I, I said it. I mean, but with, um, with um, generic Hamiltonian, I only mean some Hamiltonian with the property that all gaps are non degenerate and the differences of gaps are also non degenerate. That's the only assumption that goes in. Thanks for asking. So the equilibrium exponentially well with a Lipschitz constant that's given here that only depends on the small dimension D, the physical dimension, and the capital dimension um, uh, coming in here. Yeah. So it does equilibrate. And that's not maybe not so surprising. Of course, we would expect in kind of a statmac like property to things become um, equilibrated and stationary. But that's a setting where one can very nicely and cleanly really prove the an exponential um, uh, um, equilibration in time that also generalizes nice work by Aram Harrow and his co-worker on, 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 on product. So one can kind of prove is that's kind of the mindset. You can prove a statement on quantum statistical mechanics that seems quite out of reach otherwise, and that's really hard to come by without such tools. I should also say that while I'm a bit slop, <clears throat> it's late in the evening and so on, while I'm a bit like casual in the way I write these things, it should be clear that all of them can be made proper theorems and also proper theorems in the in the published work. They're just kind of high level um, indications of that. But all what I'm saying is actually um, uh, uh, rigorous statements of, of the kind. So they do equilibrate exponentially well. Um, how does this roughly work as a, a, a as a proof? So much of this goes around um, like what is called the effective dimension. That's a sum of fourth order polynomials that are overlaps of the initial state with many body eigenstates in the many body system. And this kind of makes sense if you really think of the literal effective dimension of how many many body eigenstates contribute to an expansion of the initial state in terms of many body eigenstates. If this is large, one would expect the system to, to equilibrate um, well. It's conceptually very well understood, but um, it's very hard to, to bound, to capture, to, to do. It's some fourth order polynomial. So, but here in this context, we can do something about it in that we can see how these um, expectation values of initial state with, with eigenstates can be seen as an expectation value over polynomials of certain random states and can express moment operators or the teeth moments operators of higher random unitaries in terms of the, the, the Weingarten calculus, but here for the tensorial many body expression at, at hand. And um, this gives rise to this tensorial um, expression where the, 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 the moments correspond to different copies of the state and the extension is the, is the, is the many body state expressed in terms of tensor networks. And then there's a kind of cute insight coming in that generalizes work by um, Nick Hunter Jones and others to this tensorial setting when, when one makes use of the commutant of the, of the group to get one and the flip operator to map this thing to the partition function of a classical statistical mechanics model. And this can be then solved and settled. This is a 
solvable classical partition function, which one can do to get the um, exponentially tight um, uh, equilibration found. So using this idea, one can show that many body systems in this generic, but now I mean generic in the sense of this random state that I picked. So to come up to your question, this equilibrates exponentially well, which is a nice thing to, to know. Um, so random matrix product space equilibrate exponentially well. That's one example of, the, of that kind. But there's also other properties one can show as further results that we also do in, the, in, in, in this work. For example, you can show that the two Rennie entropies are extensive, which is kind of natural again. Yeah, I mean, you look at like blobs of a certain size with like corridors in the middle, and you ask how do the entropies um, scale if they make the system larger? And well, the correlations are kind of short ranged. So one expects this to be kind of extensive in the system size, but it's actually commonly quite hard to prove because entropies tend to be exponentially fragile. It's not so easy to see what happens in, in, in the system size, but they actually turn out to be extensive in the system size. Also the locally reduced states that have, that not, they're not only equilibrated, but they become maximum entropy states. So they're kind of thermalizing if you want to an infinite temperature state for small connected sub subsystems. And again, one can elaborate on the notion of these states being like ground states of disordered apparent Hamiltonians in, in the sense because they're ejective, they're like the unique ground states of a disordered set of Hamiltonians, which gives insights into generic phases of matter where we have done also some steps into adding symmetries to the problem. And then looking at say generic symmetric symmetry projected topological ordered phases of, of, of the type. It's also nicely complements the work by Cecilia on the exponential decay of correlations in a very similar model, namely the translation variant version of precisely the same set of random um, matrix product states. Back at the time, we had that result as well, so that scooped us a bit, but we had something interesting to say about this kind of stuff, um, never, nevertheless. So again, I, I think I made my point. One can kind of do things that are harder to come by otherwise in, in, in that type of set. Maybe as a, as a, as a small teaser on, on work by Noah, the, the, you cannot only think of um, random tensor networks as, as tools, but, but you can also use randomness to talk about tensor networks. So I think Noah will have a poster later this week, do you, um, on using random sampling to estimate entanglement in tensor network states in terms of like random entropies of reduced density operators or negativity moments of um, states, which are usually computed in this business as computing the reduced density operator and then taking uh, moments thereof, which is very costly to do. Here, the idea is to make use of what is called a one design, one spherical one design or a frame to sample over them. But the cute thing is that you can um, sandwich a tensor network with uh, different vectors from spherical one designs so that you can perfectly sample from classically efficiently, but you couldn't do this in the lab because um, well, you have different vectors from both sides. You, that's not an experimental prescription, but you can still, because you have a classical representation, nicely do this in, on your computer. I think there will be some sort of communication from Noah um, later. This. Good, 18 minutes into the talk. I promise not to overrun. So it's a good moment to the, go to the second ramification on the linear complexity growth in random quantum circuits. Okay, what is this? So the circuit complexity is a meaningful measure. It comes in many flavors. The most plain vanilla version thereof is to define the circuit complexity of a unitary as the smallest number from a given gate set to, to exactly spell out the given unitary at hand. So if you were given certain, um, say, random circuit or some quantum circuit that gives rise to unitary, and the circuit complexity is just the smallest number of gates you could have used to give rise to that unitary. Ah, very good. I come to that. Now I want to have it exactly. So that's the original definition, but I comment on this in a second because that's a very natural question. Yeah, for now it's exact, but the gate is continuous. It makes sense. It's a continuous gate set. So we can speak about this. It's not a, it's a well-defined question. That's also how it came historically, but I will make quite a point out of that. Thanks for this wonderful um, point, yeah? Good, so, I mean, of course, the, every uh, circuit is its own description. The point is whether you can compress it, meaning whether there is a shorter description of a kind. Yeah, and that's of course highly non-trivial um, because, I mean, there could be 
something going on and then you disentangle a bit and, and there's something else that could be a very non-equivalent um, way of writing everything that is hard to find. Yeah, so in fact, um, it, it makes perfect sense. So of course, this notion of complexity is also much related to notions of computational complexity, where I would also like count, where I quantify the, the, the effort with the number of steps you need for a given input length that would categorize problems as being uh, easy when the number of steps grows slowly like a polynomial in terms of the system size and would be called hard otherwise. Also related to notions of quantum phases of matter and the way we had it before, because two states would be seen in the, being in the same phase if one can transform one to a good approximation to another one with a short ACA um, constant size quantum circuit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and placements. I mean, of course, you, you have a universal if input is the unitary and the and the gate set. And what you can do is you can place these unitaries from the gate set somewhere to get, give rise to that unitary. Um, you could. That's not part of the question, but you could. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Yeah, but um, usually it's formulated as as as. There's also related. There's also something to say. I I, I come back to your point. But for now. Fix a certain gate, fix a certain gate set, and that's what we do. I mean, this makes perfect sense. It's meaningful. It relates to computational complexity, phase of matter, and so on. It's much used. It also is much discussed. Unless it's of course not very easy to talk about that or to compute it. It's computationally hard to compute this um, because there's notorious cancellations in the way that I said. You do something, you undo something. Um, you cannot hope to find a polytime algorithm that would find an optimal decomposition of that, 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 that kind. <clears throat> so here there's the, a, a, not quite the same, but a, a, a similar problem, that's the t-count problem, it's, um, where it's stated that the runtime of the best known algorithm for the t-count problem, that's the decision problem of finding out whether the optimal gate decomposition of a circuit is given, given by a sequence of Clifford and t-gates, involves fewer than or equal to t-gates as more is, has a runtime that's stated here. Clifford gates are, to remind you, the quantum gates that are the, the, the normalizers of the Pauli group so that maintain the Pauli group up, um, up upon conjugation. T gate is like the favorite added gate that people like to add to the Cliffords to make this a universal gate set. Yeah, and this, yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's, that's, that's mutual. Um, that's right. There's mutual similar repeatability results. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It makes no difference whether it's continuous or not. Yeah, good. But this is not quite the same problem. But I mean, all of these gate synthesis problems are basically of the type. It's actually not NP hard for subtle reasons, but they have exponential runtime. Like the Microsoft Center in Washington is doing nothing else than running huge computations of doing um, gate synthesis of the type. That's a very practical. Never mind. There's no hope you can ever compute this, bound this, do anything about this. It's meaningful, but there's no nothing you can say about this. And um, this is a bit sad. Still, it's a free country. We ask what we want. So let's ask: How does the complexity actually grow with the length of the circuit for random quantum circuits? Say you take a specific architecture. Say a brickwork architecture of a kind or a random random architecture, our step is very general. But for mental clarity, let's stick to say the brickwork circuit and then to come to Gamma's point, say you take a high random set of unitaries or um, some gates from a continuous universal gate set, you place them on the brick, brick layer and then you let this grow as the size and you ask, how does the complexity grow with the length of this circuit? That's the, that's the, the question. That's a question that that's, um, one can ask. In fact, it's asked a lot. It has risen quite to prominence and was seen as an, 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 an important question in, 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 in physics, as this has been risen to, uh, risen to prominence as the so called Brown Suskin conjecture. That's admittedly a concept from physics, but I, I'm happy to share here. Um, coming from the holographic context, uh, Michael Walter will say a lot more about this and explain this. 
So holography is like a duality between two very physical different theories, namely Einstein gravity in some dimension um, and a conformal field theory, quantum conformal field theory of a dimension less sitting on the boundary. Is there a dictionary between the Einstein gravitational field and the, and the, and the quantum theory sitting on, on the boundary? And they were thinking like Suskin is a very flamboyant, eloquent uh, figure. It's, it's a quite, quite, a, quite a figure. Um, he's one of the inventors of string theory for that matter. He now tours the world of talking about this Brown Suskin conjecture of, of, of what's going on because he was fascinated by what is called um, an eternal black hole. And he was thinking that the, the volume of a wormhole would grow linearly in time for an exponentially long time. He was asking what is on the quantum side that would correspond to this linear growth of volume. So what is it that, that would grow on the, on the quantum side for a, a, a long time? linearly in time. And Tango it can't be because that would saturate quickly. So they were wondering and touring the world with the idea that there should be complexity that is growing in time, stating that this is the, 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 the quantum analog of the, of, the, of the quantum world. And they also had a conjecture what should happen here, namely that this is what happens, that you have your random quantum circuit and the random, the, the complexity of the random circuit should grow linearly in time for a very long time that is exponential in the system size and then flatter. That's what they said. And now with his kind of flamboyant style of Suskin, he also very, very, made a very um, compelling argument why that should be true. Come on, you have your random quantum circuit and Hilbert space is a huge place. You go there, you go there, you go there. I mean, how unlucky can you be that you really go backwards in this huge space? Of course, you always go basically forward. Yeah? until you come to a very long time exponential in the system size, and then you've basically sampled out the Hilbert space. And then of course you get cancellations. So that's what this is, what's behind it. And here's also a back of envelope calculation of, of counting numbers and gates, and then you get it. But of course it's not so easy because there are cancellations. Yeah, I mean a bit, but of course to make it a theorem, it's, it, it will cancel and then you have to kind of see what's going on and how this cancels or doesn't. And you have no way of computing this quantity and bounding or, I mean, we've tried this on the computer. I mean, even for tiny systems, it's, it's forget about it, no way. How would one judge? But yes, it's true. Indeed, the linear growth conjecture is true until exponential time, that's a probably true statement. That's in the paper that will hopefully come out tomorrow in, in, in nature physics as, as, as a statement. So indeed, it, it's true, it does grow until a long time and then will flatten out. Um, good. How, 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 how is this true? Um, okay, the, the complexity is too difficult uh, a, a beast to tackle. We are not going there. We will do something slightly simpler, a kind of an object of a type of a dimension of something of a quasi algebraic set that I will come to in a second that we, it's kind of a bit easier to, to, to tackle in, in, in a way. That's what we will have a look at. We will be the, the small guy. Pick, uh, poking the, the complexity beast you want. So you, you have like your, your continuous gate set that's somewhere. And then you have an architecture. Think of this as a brick layout setting. Okay, and then you start placing these gates onto that architecture. One by one, bum, 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 bum. That gives rise to a certain unitary. Yeah, now either way, there's a map that we call contraction map. That's just the map from the, from the gates to the implementation in the big Hilbert space. That's the image U of A. And that's just the reachable set that you can get by turning the knobs of the, of the, of the gates. Yeah? This is actually a pretty nasty set. It's not a manifold. Um, it's like fingery and funny, but you can define it. It's a set, a reachable set of unitaries. Um, good. Okay, now the, in, the insight is that the, the set here that you get, I mean, the, the set of, 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 of unitary gates, that's what is called the quasi algebraic set. Most of you will know what that is. It sounds fanciful. It's just a set that's governed by polynomial equ equalities and inequalities. And much of the heavy lifting is done by the so called Tarski Seidenberg principle that says that the image under a polynomial map, which we have if we place the gates onto the circuit, happens to be a quasi algebraic set. Well, that's kind of nice. Um, because the, yeah, that does actually some of the, of, of, of the heavy lifting because we can then see that the accessible dimension, that's kind of the dimension of that set, 
I mean, this, these sets are like collections of manifolds. Think of like the, the unit disk, the closed unit disk on the, on the, on, in R2. That's not a manifold, but the unit circle is dimension one. The open disk is also a manifold, dimension two, and that dimension would be two for, for, for that quasi algebraic set. Yeah? Joe jo will um, smile about this. But that's the accessible dimension. And that is the, 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 the dimension that we have here in, in our, our setting because the set is, is a no manifold. And then one can go on to show that this dimension is almost always the same. It takes the maximum value throughout the domain up to a set of, that's an algebraic set of measure zero and is closed at the same time. So almost all the time you get the maximum um, value anyway, and then you kind of turn things upside down and you only have to show that there is some family of circuits that take that, um, that maximum value instead of optimizing over all possible circuits. And what could that be then looking at Clifford circuits yeah, random Clifford circuits, which one uses to identify a point where the dimension grows linearly with the circuit depth. Yeah, this one does, and then one demonstrates the point's existence of, oh yeah, that, by perturbing Clifford circuits. So what does that mean? You'd have a random Clifford circuit, and then you have a point, and we just want to see what's the, like how many, in, how many directions can you walk, or what's the rank of the Jacobian if you want? Like, I mean, how, yeah, what's, what, how many directions can, can, can you do? And what you do, you have your, your direction, you expand this in Pauli's, and you have your coefficients, you, you have the whole thing in Pauli's, and then you pull it through the, the, the circuit, but this is a Clifford circuit. So of course you can conjugate this through the Clifford circuit and get another Pauli thing, and then you basically count the independent directions that you, that you can have. Now while the first part is like deeper and, and more foundational and also cute to, to put things upside down. This is actually tedious in practice, but it's quite natural in, in, in this, quite natural in doing. You really have to see how many um, independent directions survive and see what the, what the rank of the Jacobian is in the set. Yes, please. Um, it's, um, the difficult part is showing that it's not sublinear. That's the point, that you have a lower bound that grows. That's the difficult part. That's right, that's, no, that's right. Thanks for the question. That's the difficult bit. That the, the cancellations are there, but they, they are not too much. And that you have a lower bound that grows. That's the, the, non, the, the non trivial bit. That's right, because the upper bound is trivial. That's right. Yeah, but then this is like, this is hard work. I mean, this is like a couple of pages of work, but this is just some um, quantum information stuff of, of conjugating Pauli's to Clifford's, yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Brick layer. Mm -hmm. No, no, but, but this is general. That's actually, we, have, we, we can do this for all random circuits that have a backward um, causal cone so that everybody is talking to everyone. Did that answer your question? Good. So indeed, uh, this is even uh, I have a slide on this. There is a linear growth. Um, there's not a conjecture, there's a theorem. And that's true until exponential time. It's provably true and there's a lower bound um, in, in that in terms of chunks of certain unitaries that are, to answer your question, just chunks of the backward light cone. Think of the brick layer that would be just a chunk of length of the system size, a, a square that would be one unit, and this would be growing linearly in the number of units. So that's a theorem, at, it's a true statement. That division is true, and at the end of the day, it's really a kind of a counting argument, but a, a subtle counting argument, not a naive one where you say, oh, it should be like that, but using that machinery, you can really count it and get a bound that is linearly um, growing of the time, yeah. Oh, almost certainly. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Um, good. So again, what, what is there to be done here? Um, Joe's question, approximate notions. I mean, this is, oh, the good news is that um, that was the original question, how it was posed and how the, the high energy people would, would be talking about this. Of course, I, mean, I share Joe's intuition that it would be very nice to think of an approximate notion thereof, where you want to in oper operate around just approximate the, the circuit, but not exactly. We have a statement of that kind, but we have very little control of the Lifshitz constant of that. So the weakest link of our work, which I freely share, is the, the little control over the Lifshitz constant. So there's more, more work to be done. Also, one can think of notions of connections to Nielsen complexity. We talk a bit about this. Nielsen complexity is something very similar in that you have a, a, a think of the circuit as the implementation of a Hamiltonian that's fluctuating in time in terms of certain Paulis with time fluctuating prefactors. And then you just take the, the cost 
as the minimum L1 norm, L2 norm of the shortest circuit in that part. That's a very nice differential geometric picture of, of, of a cost that's, that high energy physics people love for reasons unknown to me because you can't compute it, but it's, it's, it's very common and one can make connections to this and entanglement. So I even had a bit of a little single author PL last year on that question. I'm happy to say more about this. If, if you're interested that there's a bit of something one can say about entanglement in this complex. But of course the big question is how one can connect that to, to actually quantum chaotic dynamics more to the real thing of not talking at the random circuits as proxies, but is there something to be said about the actual dynamics that, that this should represent? And if there's time, I'll, I'll say a bit more about it. Okay. But 35 minutes into the talk, I better um, I come to the last part, but I, I, I sneak in this one little thing because my meta question here is that random circuits are fun. And the most counterintuitive thing I've, I've, I'm aware of that came out of our group is this notion of a quantum homopathy that I have just have to share, which is the following. If you take a random quantum Clifford circuit, there are designs, two designs, which is ubiquitous in the theory of randomized benchmarking, but they're not just not four designs. They gracefully fail to be four designs, as one says, just whoo, a bit. But of course you can sneak in other gates, like T gates, to uplift them to a universal gate set. And then it's kind of clear that if you sneak in T gates plus Cliffords, they give rise to a full scale universal circuit, so on an, a, a design. But now we have a theorem um, with our friends from Cologne, or with David actually, of course, in, in, in Cologne, that says that the number of um, T gates that's needed scales as T to the power four log square T log one over epsilon to uplift this sort of epsilon approximate T design like T is 20, say for 10,000 qubits to get a 20 design, you need so many T gates to put in. Wait a minute, there's no N. That doesn't depend on the system size. You have any N 10 million and T is 20 and you put them in, you just put the 20 T gates in, uh, the, the, the five T gates in and that's enough. So this universality is like a like homopathy. You can put that in and that spreads out in the system and the univers universality goes all over the place and you can uplift an arbitrary circuit to a full unitary T design for any T independent of the system size. I find that interesting. Anyway, it's constant number. Last bit in three minutes on random um, tensors for quantum fields and holography, maybe also a bit of a teaser for what Michael Walter is going to say later in this week. So um, what's, what's the deal? So again, the ADSC of the correspondence is physically motivated. I should say that this paper suggesting this is the most cited paper in the history of physics. So if you're a physicist, I mean, this, that's what people like. Um, whatever that means, of course. Um, and um, again, this is correspondence between Einstein gravity and, and a form of, form of free theory that's kind of abstract. And tensor networks have been suggested to be very concrete and very hands on example toy models of that correspondence that can really flesh out things in, in, in very hands on and, and, and practical way. I would love to say more about this. That's a topic that we've spent quite some time with. Um, over, over, over the years. One way of thinking about this is that you have your tiling of the plane that can be seen as a negatively curved space time because the tiling is negatively curved and you place tensors there that are so-called match gate tensors. What is that? Yes, that's right, yeah. So there's many fanciful way of saying that and I, I, I'm able to say it in fanciful terms, in the non-fanciful terms, it's just pre-fermions, right? So non-interacting fermions, which in the Jordan Wigner representation would be a spin coming in and you have spins coming out as tensor legs and you contract the whole thing until you get a state on the boundary. And there's lots of interesting games you can do. You can change the curvature of the bulk and then massage the decay of correlations on the boundary and everything in analytical terms, yeah? So this can be efficiently and in instance even analytically contracted, which is a nice place to be in because you really get formulas for what you get out. And the most hands-on formula you get is when you even do it further and not only think of match gate tensor networks, but the intersection of match gates and what is it called a stabilizer state. And usually when you intersect two simple sets, you get just mumbo jumbo. But here you get interestingly, still a rather interesting set out, which are paired Majorana, the paired Majoranas that sit on the boundary the spaghetti picture. Yeah, and there, it's just a kind of counting argument of, of paired Majorans on the, on the boundary, but you can really compute everything exactly in an analytic field. For example, you can look at the entanglement entropy on the boundary, 
and you get an infinite sum as an expression you can really write down. And then you compare it with the conformal uh, uh, for the entropy formula for conformal field theory, and then you can match it and see that you get this whole thing out, a critical theory with a certain conformal chart, but analytically as, as a theorem, if you want. It's kind of nice. Also, if you, you can think of building up that tensor network by starting in the middle and then layer by layer going from the inside to the outside by applying inflation rules, mapping A to ABA and B to AB, AB, AB and something, going layer by layer to get a state on the boundary that is, has what is called a quasi-crystal symmetry. So um, it's, it's, it has the symmetry of a quasi-crystal. You really go layer by layer and you can not only get a critical state on the boundary, but really get, can think of special conformal transformations in, as in conformal field theory, but up to this quasi-crystal symmetry. It's a nice toy model where everything can be spelled down out and, and done very nicely, except that you have this quasi-crystal symmetry at, at, at hand. So this is already done and published work. What we are doing now since two years with, with um, Alex Alt and Caro Ville of using random match gate tensors, where one does the same but places random match gates on these settings, where actually the disorder average can be done analytically as certain uh, path integrals. So when one gets analytical expressions for the for the tensors at the outside as disorder averages, which can even be done in the continuum, which is an interesting setting um, to think about. Good. 40 minutes into the talk, then I should stop because I think this, this includes questions. So let's see what we've done today or in the last talk. Okay, so we set out to kind of make the point that random tensor networks, random circuits are nice playgrounds to say things that are not so easy to come by otherwise. And I think there is a point to that, to that, that effect that, that we can make here. So we started out to think of notions of statistical mechanics, how equilibria emerge and so on, which is brutally natural. Nobody expects a surprise here, but it's a setting where we start out in an initial state and you can prove that there's a very strong equilibration reflecting the expectations from quantum statistical mechanics, making use of random tensor networks, random tensor trains, random matrix product states, if you, if you want, which is a, is a wonderful playground to be in. That same applies to Cecilia's beautiful work. Of course, it would be nice to think of more physical probability measures, say that are not just some state that are grounds of some disorder phase of matter, but which are more physically motivated. And there are some thoughts that go into that direction. More work needs to be done. And there are some ideas that I'm happy to share. Second, we set out to discuss the brown Susskind conjecture that we were happy to solve in that it is true, the complexity does grow linearly in time until a very, very long time. That's exponential in the system size. That's wonderful. It brings in the kind of fresh tools to the field, which are unexpected. So it's kind of mathematically also interesting. But the, the elephant in the room is like approximate notions, which might need very different tools. So to really make this work, this is not going to be easy. And I'm happy to share why that is um, as well. And then the last bit, we hinted at ideas of tensor networks for holography that Michael Walter will spend a lot of time with you later this week. He has excellent things to say about this where one can take steps of really getting the full conformal field theories out in the picture of a random tensor network framework, which is great to have. And so these are nice tools, these random tensor networks, these random circuits. In, in a way, of course, they're very random and you need the randomness. That's kind of the tool you think of like Brownian circuits where you have fresh randomness over and over again. But say in this complexity growth, you would want to, let's say, have a trotterized fluctuating Hamiltonian in time or even one random Hamiltonian that you draw once and for all, and then just evolve in time. It's a Floquet setting, if you want, compared to the Brownian set. I have a little randomness. And that's physically more well motivated, and that's very nice, but that's mathematically much harder to come by. So randomness is the tool, random tensors, that's the theme of our workshop. But the more randomness you have, the easier it gets mathematically, but you want to de-randomize this as much as you can. So, how much randomness do we really need at the end of the day to think of random tensor networks? And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions you might possibly have.